get the slides. Great, everybody see that okay? I see thumbs up, perfect. Okay, so, um, I, and I did, I put your Harvard logo on here and our Colorado one's just showing that we're together in this as the Implementation Science Centers for Cancer Control Prevention. We really appreciate you in inviting me to present and to bring our Colorado um, colleagues along today. Um, I titled the talk, The Reaim Framework and Health Equity, Where Have We Been and Where Are We Going? And I'm trying to also take a little bit of a more global lens to implementation and health equity, but that seemed suitable for the title and for where we'll start. Um, just doing some acknowledgements. We already talked a lot about the ISC3 piece, but acknowledging Russ, um, Worsh Karabin, our whole DNI science program here at University of Colorado, Reaim colleagues, and I'll bring in some work we're doing in the NHLBI Decipher Network around trying to um, tweak um, DNI frameworks with an equity lens. So particular credits to Alex Stopp and Lillian Perez for that work. So it takes a village and what I'm showing comes from many people's shoulders before me. Uh, this is a roadmap for a whirlwind <clears throat> journey. We're gonna start with where we've been, some timeless aspects of re-aim and health equity, things that have been there from the beginning where we're going, some novel aspects of that, um, particularly bringing in some of the elements of PRISM, the uh, extension of contextual factors that predict re-aim outcomes as they relate to health equity. And we, uh, Shoba mentioned, we do wanna hear from you, um, particularly asking you to think about if there's something you might wanna share in a, a couple of minutes about the intersection of health equity and DNI science. It's always great to have examples, and I don't have as many examples in this talk. It's a little more theoretical. So reaim, um, purpose and history, the where we've been. Um, so reaim was intended to facilitate the translation of research to practice when Russ Glasgow and colleagues developed it. Thanks for us for being on the line and being our on-call reaim expert for questions at the end. Um, it balances internal and external validity and emphasizes representativeness. So I really put that in blue as a key feature that is why reaim has always had equity baked in from the beginning. What's the representativeness of patients and clients who are reached, of settings and staff that adopt, of maintenance for setting staff and patients. So that's always been explicitly expected to be reported. It's got the individual factors of reach and effectiveness and then the multi-level organizational factors. The public health impact depends on all of those elements. I'm gonna show a cascade diagram in a bit about that. First, this is just the reminder of for each dimension. For, in, for any of those of you we haven't fully influenced to just drink all REAM Kool-Aid and know these things by heart, um, just going through them a moment. Uh, so the REAM dimension of reach, it's who is intended to benefit and who actually participates. Again, the representativeness, effectiveness, measuring the most important benefits and also negative outcomes. Adoption, where is it applied? Who's intended to apply it? Who actually applies it? Again, which settings actually apply it? Can it only be um, delivered in the most high resource settings with the best organizational capacity, or is it something that even low resource settings can adopt? Implementation, how consistently is it, uh, is it implemented? How will it be adapted? I put these things in blue that are sort of provocative questions like, is it too complex? Um, can it, does it have to be adapted? Can places adapt it? Do we give any guidance on how to adapt it? Or are you just sort of left to yourself to figure it out? How much will it cost? Why will the results come about? And then maintenance um, factors with relation to sustainment and sustainability, which we're gonna talk a little bit more later. So this is the notion of the cascading effects and how when we put, um, when I have the disparity column here, so I have the left-hand column, the re-aim domain or issue, middle column, the notion there's a disparity or there's difference um, in equity in how this is distributed. And then what happens to the overall impact, who is left out, so to speak. So when reach, there's a disparity in reach, then there's a, a disparity to the impact. Only 70% would benefit. And you see, as you go down, even if the effectiveness is equal, um, there's not an inequity in how effective the program is. Inequities or lack of representativeness at the other levels of reach, adoption and implementation and maintenance will lead to quite a disparity or quite an inequity um, in the end for different populations. 
So I said I would speak a little bit about the notion of health equity and implementation science writ large. And so Nure and colleagues, including Bethany Kwan from our CTSA, uh, Rachel Shelton, who's also featured in other publications in this talk, um, published this recently on the need for us to tailor implementation frameworks to health equity and to tailor equity frameworks to implementation. So the, the notion is we want to sensitize um, evidence-based interventions with equitable dissemination and implementation. And we want to operationalize um, health equity interventions. So it's uh, some nice notions about how we want to draw on each other's strengths as fields um, from, from the respective fields of health equity research and implementation science research. And it urges us to think more about things like I'm talking about today. Uh, with re-aim, are there ways to think about um, equity even more than we have in years past? So some, some of the things evolving with re-aim um, as we try to include this greater consideration of health equity, uh, one piece to improve the transparency of reporting representativeness. So it's always been there. It's always been in the definition, but when people say they're following re-aim and reporting according to re-aim, are they actually getting to the level of representativeness? And to what extent do certain things with journal page limits, et cetera, make that a struggle to get all of that information in there? And another separate thing is to go upstream using re-aim for planning beginning with the end in mind. So I'm gonna show a couple of things for that. On improving the transparency of reporting, what I'm showing here is an excerpt, excerpt from our expanding the consort figure paper that Russ and I co-authored a few years back. And the notion is you can take your regular consort diagram and put some things on top of it. So you can see the very bottom of this diagram is where the usual consort diagram picks up. And this is laying, layering on top a piece around settings and staff and um, how those things are representative or not, how many settings were excluded of those that were eligible, how many declined and putting in some reasons for this. Um, so at a high level, people can digest if they, they see this, you know, the external validity of um, how your program was rolled out. That's one notion is improve the transparency of reporting. Go upstream and begin with the end in mind, using re-aim domains to guide planning, not just using re-aim as an evaluation framework, but using it earlier on with stakeholders um, to guide the implementation plan and potentially even with the recent movement towards using re-aim with implementation to make some midstream corrections. So this paper with Shelton and colleagues um, described doing this in particular with a focus on equity and sustainability. And considering you can see on this yellow lens, so we've got, slides got a lot going on. In the middle, you've got your evidence-based intervention components and your implementation strategies. Then you've got your reach domains in the green. And then the notion that these things you're triangulating with stakeholders to think about equity, to pay attention to dynamic context and culture and um, cost and capacity. And that overall, there's a general focus on sustainability and sustainment um, that is uh, part of this process. That's the idea of begin with the end in mind, go upstream. And then just unpacking sustainability a bit more and thinking about how we're equitably considering equity there. Um, but the notion that core program functions are able to stand the test of time. There's some evolvability of the program that the organizational capacity can be sustained. There, there's ways to sustain it. Those are some of the things that have come to, uh, come to that. So then uh, the idea here is um, we wanna be able to operationalize these dynamic considerations while planning and implementing there, there's a thought of, you know, considering as you're upstream, what will it take to re increase re aim domain inserted here in an equitable and representative way and working with stakeholders to, to get this feedback as part of the implementation plan. Um, from Meredith Fort, Russ Glasgow, and Spiro Manson, who are working on a paper in this vein, and they kindly shared um, some of their early thinking here. One of the ideas with adoption, for example, was let's specifically think about where and if we need to increase organizational capacity, um, making sure our intervention could also have attention to how it could be delivered by groups that have more limited organizational capacity and then other notions. And they might step in and give us a little more information on that. This slide I adapted in the interest of time to um, note one of the other 
big, uh, bigger, newer de uh, developments in reaim lately with respect to F uh, equity is as we think about context and the prism contextual factors that um, predict reaim outcomes. We're going to go into that here in a moment. So prism again being a whirlwind of things here. Um, Prism has these contextual factors in this top half of the diagram that predict and relate to the re-aim outcomes on the bottom. And they include the intervention, uh, the organizational perspective and a patient perspective or a client perspective, not always in healthcare on an intervention and then client characteristics, organizational characteristics that are just characteristics of the individuals, the implementation and sustainability infrastructure and the external environment. So these are the domains we can tech the, uh, that we consider as um, what, what helps uh, to move the needle on re-aim outcomes, so to speak. And the, there's the notion of, as we talked about in the sustainability article, these things are multi-level, they're dynamic. There needs to be some uh, way to deal with things changing over time. We can't just do stakeholder engagement once at the beginning and expect it's gonna have everything figured out forever. <clears throat> so, now I'm going to kind of, I gave you that introduction to PRISM. I'm going to try to pull it all together and put a bow on it with the notion of, could we blend some frameworks in this way um, and do helpful things? So Woodward and colleagues developed the health equity implementation framework by blending the health disparity framework and the iParis implementation science framework. And this is their overall framework, a visual of it on the right-hand side. But they also said, if you're just trying to sensitize other DNI frameworks to equity or tweak other frameworks, these are the three things you should really consider tailoring and bringing in. And they are the culturally relevant factors of the recipients. So recipient patient factors, recipient provider factors, the interactions between the intervention implementers and recipients represented here as a clinical encounter, but if it's not in healthcare, it could also be with a different implementer and a client. And then the societal context being this ring that goes around the outside, the ring of societal influence. So they said, think about those things if you're not updating iParis, but a different framework. So here's where I bring in um, Alex Dopp and Lillian Fresen, the, um, the Cypher Network. So this is a, a program funded by NHLBI that has seven uh, sites around the country. And different sites are using different frameworks, right? We all like our own thing. Some sites are using EPIS, some sites are using CIFR, some sites are using PRISM. Everyone's using REAIM, it turns out. They had just all proposed to use REAIM outcomes at the outset. So we were asked, since the contextual factors are being measured either by EPIS or PRISM for the most part, we're also gonna to try to bring in CIFR. Could we try to come up with some common language, a common visual, a common nomenclature for the way we're measuring context across our projects so we could perhaps draw some common conclusions? And could we please use health equity principles because this is a disparities um, grant, it's dissemination and disparities. So this is a little busy, but I didn't tell you at all about EPIS, but it's just up here. So the EPIS framework is at the top. This is its original framework. This is its more updated visual, very pretty. We've got PRISM down in the lower left. This is PRISM's most updated visual. Um, and then we've got the notion of these three domains that Woodward and colleagues asked us to try to incorporate into frameworks. So um, what we did was we looked into all of the um, primary literature on these things and looked at cross maps and talked it over and had discussions. And we thought this was something that could sort of take the base characteristics of EPIS and of PRISM and could blend them together with attention to these equity factors. So we, we've got some inner context, inner setting on the right-hand side. You can see the prism things remain here with organizational perspectives on an innovation and organizational factors. This shouldn't just be personnel, but organizational factors, patient factors, patient perspectives. We're using from EPIS, the bridging innovation characteristics, the bridging, bridging factors. And we thought there was alignment between implementation and sustainability uh, infrastructure of prism in that piece and also drew in these bridging relationships elsewhere, have the external setting, external environment over here. And the things we brought in from uh, Woodward's framework, we uh, have the culturally relevant factors highlighted here, and also for organization um, personnel. We highlighted them in a clinical encounter, or this would also just be an interaction between implementers and clients. The societal context for now we put out here, although we, we recognize it really ripples throughout, we've 
<clears throat> kind of put it on the outside because it's everywhere. It's like air. So uh, we had trouble putting in just one place. But that's um, how we've developed it so far. And we've presented this to our internal group. That's as far as we are. I'm sharing it with you really as like a work in progress. Um, would love to hear your thoughts about how this resonates, um, things that are interesting about it or not. And that's my time. Thanks so much, Amy. That was fantastic. And it was a whirlwind tour, but I think we were all able to follow along. So that was really great. Um, I want to open it up to the group and see if folks have questions, comments. I didn't see any questions coming through in the chat, um, although I, it's great to see the shared resources. So maybe while we're waiting for folks to, to think about their questions, I'll ask you one of mine, Amy. Um, so I, I really liked what you were saying about this idea of, of bringing together the the DNI frameworks and adding this concept of um, you know, implementation sustainment infrastructure. And so one of the things I was wondering about um, is if you've tried to capture or you know of others who have tried to capture these broader infrastructure kind of outcomes that might come from an implementation effort. Because I'm thinking if we're fundamentally interested in addressing equity, if we leave a system better primed to promote equity for the next EBI or the adaptive version, um, that, that's a win. And it seems to me that we may not be counting that. So I wonder if you could speak to that at all. I love that comment. I'll make a brief, uh, <clears throat> I'll make a brief comment myself and would love others to, to step in as well. It reminds me of, we've had some of these discussions in our Accords DNI team meeting and I can kind of hear Jody Holtrup in my head, you know, saying like, well, if we can just raise all boats, you know, if we can increase the organizational capacity so that the groups can do most multiple things, if maybe it's again part of why leadership is always such a common contextual factor that predicts good implementation because it means the organizational capacity there is good. So I really take your point of, and then how do we measure that? I think that was your question. How do we measure that? <clears throat> we obviously have some measures of things like organizational capacity, implementation climate. I think um, the, the, for depending on the project, we feel like they function better or not, you know, might, might have better internal validity or not. Those would be some of my answers. I think qualitatively here, a lot of that as well, right? Just did, why did it work here? Why didn't it work here? And how did it, how did you get it better? Um, so some of it's the trying to have good valid measures that we can do quantitatively, but some of it is making sure we unpack in the qualitative how it worked for you and then try to see if we can translate in that into implementation strategies that others could use elsewhere. Other Great. Do others want to jump in with that? Kelly, I see you're unmuted. I have a question. Hi. Hi, Amy. Thanks so much for your <laughs> presentation. Um, Maybe it's a preview for our DNI panel on equity and methods um, upcoming. So I I have a question about the M phase in reaim, <laughs> the maintenance phase, and um, the extent. So things like building capacity in kind of creating a climate for equity, it seems like you can think about doing those things up front <laughs> more easily than you can think about doing them at the back end. So if you're studying maintenance and you see that kind of depressing statistic where it's really inequitable after something's been implemented and it's in the M phase of re-aim. And I'm just curious if your group have start to think about implement, well, I guess, they wouldn't be implementation strategies, but maybe maintenance <laughs> strategies that you you know come along with maybe a, a group where there's minimal threshold implementation in the maintenance phase, and you're looking at equity and thinking about you know strategies for working with um, and during that phase around improving equitable maintenance of interventions, kind of at the back end of of the, at the end of REAIM, which seems to not get a lot of attention, um, as much attention as the earlier implementation phases. I'm curious if you guys have been thinking about that. I love that question. Uh, um, at risk of, so Meredith and Russ, I know, is that a piece that you feel like your paper that you're working on together is addressing to some extent, or I see Meredith smiling. Uh, <laughs> 
a smile, a smile that's not so clear to me, but what do you think, Meredith? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think it's probably in, to some extent, it's how you're considering um, or, or um, applying maintenance in your, um, uh, in whatever project or application you're, you're using. But um, we do talk about it a little bit in the in progress paper. Um, and in part, it does relate to the other question um, in terms of the implementation and sustainability infrastructure and thinking about um, really having the, uh, you know, how you institutionalize the assessment of equity um, and whether or not that's, you know, there is somebody who's, that's their job to do it. Um, it's, if that's something that's prioritized, if that's something that's kind of defined um, within whatever it is, the effort it, that, that you're aiming to do, the program or the, or the, the policy change. Um, and then uh, um, I think that at least is one of the ways that we were referring to it. Um, Russ may have other thoughts. Just a couple points. And then by no means do we feel we have this worked out. So I'd love your uh, thoughts and, uh, and input there. Um, but we do think it's a critical issue. Uh, we like to use, like probably some of you, the phrase designing for dissemination and sustainability. So, you know, from the outset, uh, that this notion, not, not waiting. Um, recently, what we've been trying to do is use a process that we call iterative re-aim that uh, goes through during the intervention and using, like Meredith said, where you can tracking data uh, like on the re-aim dimensions, on the reach, who are you reaching, who's participating, who's benefiting, who isn't on an ongoing basis, and then use that to design adaptations with, with a notion uh, towards, always towards maintenance. So you kind of have this continual, continuous, not quite too strong a word, but movement towards that. Um, then more generally, uh, this paper that Rachel Shelton led uh, for us that David Chambers and I came along for the ride on, um, we do think a lot about issues there, specifically about including different uh, outcomes to when you think about uh, sustainment, you know, not just sustaining the program or the outcomes or capacity, as you referred to, and that sort of thing, but also in other factors, if you recall that figure that uh, Amy uh, showed you, uh, we think explicitly that cost and burden is a really critical issue for sustainability, uh, especially relative to equity. Uh, issues there. And that's both at the participant level, you know, how much time burden cost is them, but also at the setting level and the staff level and things. And we think that many well-meaning interventions are designed because we focus so much on, quote, what's effective, you know, meaning of those who participate, you know, and stay there, that we inadvertently, unintentionally, like can really, uh, you know, exacerbate uh, inequities there because uh, not only the individual's approach, but the very settings that have the most contact and things are going to be excluded because they just don't have the resources. As I expected, Meredith and Russ could have answered that better than me. I'm glad I asked them each to, to weigh in. I think, you know, Russ, what you were just saying to, I'm going to finish real quick and then open up to more comments. We, we get, um, we've been receiving a bit of flack or backlash sometimes with the iterative re-aim notion of how it might be in your intervention and implementation strategies are changing fluidly as you go and um, what are you really assessing then. But if it's something you're especially doing in a maintenance phase or you're baking in for the end of a program in some way, shape or form, it could be an intriguing way to kind of get around that, but also deal with what you said, Kelly, you know, how do you try to keep things rolling in a maintenance phase. And obviously then a grant's not paying for that. You're having to figure out how stakeholders support it. That's great, thank you. I realized I was on mute earlier, but I was echoing this idea of the sort of constant revisiting and finding these additional gaps and, and thinking about how we address that. I really like that. Steve, I see that you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah. really terrific talk. And, and I just wanna follow up on Kelly's question. Two simple questions, not so simple, I guess. Uh, maybe it is. Um, is maintenance a verb? 
And is this, is this synonymous with sustainment, which is a noun? Or, or is it a phase or is it a thing? And when we look back, when we think about re-aim, I've seen it used both ways, right? It's a phase, we do something to maintain stuff, or alternatively, it's been maintained, it's been sustained. So I'd love to hear from the Colorado group, who are the experts in, in, in re-aim, how you think about the M versus the S, the maintenance versus sustain. And then the second question is, we have all of these theoretical constructs and REAM has been fabulous because it actually is a pragmatic measure where people actually apply it and measure real measurable outcomes. Do, has anyone really looked at long-term maintenance, the M, empirically? Do we actually know, we theorize what maintains the state, but are there any good long-term studies that have actually asked and answered what does predict long-term maintenance? Does adaptation do it? Does evolution do it? Does fidelity do it? Does, does anyone really know, or are we really still at the phase, which is fine, of coming with theoretical constructs and hypothesizing, but we haven't really answered the question yet? Great question, Steve. Um, let's see. Um... Maybe where I'll start with is where you left off of the empirical factors related to sustainability and sustainment. You were asking related to sustainment of the, and I'll, maybe I'll try to define those terms, right? Sustainability is something is able to be sustained and then sustainment is you can measure it with a percentage and it was sustained. So we'll think of the, um, how you look, it looks like something that, you know, it looks like it has good sustainability and then did it actually prove it, was it sustained? Um, for the sustainability, right, we have like the CSAT and the PSAT from Doug Luke and colleagues. So um, the clinical sustainability, I'm blanking on the rest of those terms. If someone can rescue me and put that in the chat. Assessment tool. Thank you, assessment tool. Um, so originally developed as PSAT. And if I remember from Doug's talk on this PSAT, had a fair bit of empirical data for it, CSAT a little less, so they kind of adapted it from the PSAT, so may not have had quite as much empirical data, um, but they realized the importance of workflows quite a bit for CSAT versus PSAT, and that if you, you're kind of dead in the water, if it couldn't fit with the workflow of the, um, the team, the clinical teams. Um, so I think we have empirical data for sustainability, but I think you asked what empirical data do we have for sustainment or for maintenance, and that I don't know that we have it. Um, I'm gonna, you know, phone a friend for anyone to step in with ideas there. And I think I defined as I was talking through it then the notion of, so maintenance is sustainment. And then in PRISM, we have the implementation and sustainability infrastructure. So we think of sustainability as a contextual factor that relates to sustainment. Russ, please uh, help me out if I went astray there. I'll start, and I'd love to get a broader dialogue, particularly you know from the Harvard folks jump in here too. So, Steve, my smart ants, uh, smart ass answers to your questions are uh, one, both, and it depends. Um, what I mean by that is the both. I think is historically we've thought of maintenance as Amy said, synonymous with sustained mud, as kind of a phase. I do think increasing though, we're thinking of it as a process too, this notion that it is dynamic, you know, there isn't one magic point about three months, it starts maintenance, you know, and then it ends at 12 months. So I, I think increasingly we're doing that and trying to discuss some of these issues. Again, I keep going back to this paper that uh, Rachel led us on that helped us do a fair amount of uh, introspection around that. In terms of the empirical data, I think both, uh, as Amy mentioned, those measures, and then there's been a couple, there's a lot of stuff going on and development of measures now, but two of them that come to mind are uh, one, Greg uh, Aaron's group uh, is working a lot on availability. And I think the first author in the most recent paper is Moulin. I apologize, I'm probably butchering the name. Uh, and there's a nice uh, composite measure, a really brief pragmatic, you'll like it, Steve, pragmatic three or four item measure there. And then Larry Palenkos, uh, a year or so ago, and colleagues has come out with a, if you're more into a psychometrically sophisticated uh, measure, that again, that one does try to look at both sustainability factors related and sustainment. 
I'm not quite sure exactly where they, what the literature was about identifying those factors, you know, that were identifying. The, the best empirical data that I know of comes out of some folks at uh, U, uh, UW, uh, Washington, um, the Peggy Han and Jeff Harris group, who partnered like for years and looked at, uh, I think it's called Enhanced Fitness, a physical activity, community-based physical activity program, and followed people like, I don't know, out at least a decade or so. Great, thank you. Karen, I see that you have a hand up. Yeah, um, so again, a terrific uh, talking, really, really um, helpful framing, and great to see all the work that's going on in this space. For the last few years, Russ has been talking about what I've always thought about in my head is the one tail, two tail problem. You know, we approach our work as if it's a, a one tail test. Everything is only going to go in a positive direction when in fact we should be looking at both positive and negative outcomes and we do a terrible job at that. And I was really excited to see that in your reformulation and in actually how you're encouraging people to think about equity that the negative side the negative outcomes piece is in there can you just say a little bit more about how you're approaching that how people are responding to that if you've been doing that and what you're seeing i just think that's critically important in what we do especially when we're trying to think about equity meredith do you want to start out that one and then i'll let uh i'll let uh, amy uh jump in Sure. Um, hopefully, I, I'm going to take it in the direction that you were thinking. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the um, areas that um, we're interested in exploring, this is more of the theoretical uh, response, is considering the trade-offs that there are even within the um, different dimensions of re-aim. So considering at the um, of more at the individual or patient level, the reach and effectiveness trade-offs, and then um, potential other trade-offs between um, certainly maintenance, you know, is one that has already been talked about and sustainability of trying to, you know, invest um, maybe in, too intensely in, a, in an intervention approach that then could not be sustained um, to the, you know, the extent that people would um, ideally like and, you know, considering um, those trade-offs and assessing at multiple time points and also reflecting on them up front. So I think that's a, at least an initial um, response. Russ, I'm not sure if that's uh, what you were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, just quickly, I was uh, trying to prod you a little bit to talk about some of the work you're thinking about applying uh, systems dynamic modeling and re-aim to and potential issues that uh, kind of predict or expose some things. Maybe you want to say a word and then I'll, I'll shut up and let Amy and <laughs> others <laughs> respond. Yeah, I think this is... Um... I, I think uh, still uh, in the, the ideas development phase, but thinking about the potential of applying um, different methods like system dynamics to explore some of those um, potential trade-offs um, and uh, kind of the, the unintended consequences of um, some of the proposed uh, interventions and trying to do that upfront and then um, uh, simulating, you know, what could happen and then assessing it later on. Great, and um, yeah, I think Karen, sometimes we think in implementation work, since we're implementing evidence-based programs, everything should just be rosy, right? So like, why do we have to think about the negative? So I like you bringing this up and pushing that two-tail problem, as you said. Um, we've been thinking just as one example, really, um, as we thought through the, the IRB and the human subjects portion of an implementation study for school-based asthma program, what, what things you know, could be the negatives. Um, we thought through the clinical angles, and I think the clinical angles obviously vary depending on what the study is. This is asthma, so we're like, well, if the kids are getting too much prednisone, maybe they gain weight, or maybe they um, you know, uh, have these other behavioral issues sometimes we get with too much prednisone. So we thought about the clinical angle. I think that's a natural one. It's, we're thinking of often clinical effectiveness for the patient, the benefits, so what are clinical harms? But then I think the other piece, um, you know, our, our program also involves some social determinants of health screening and referral and the issues with potentially stigmatizing um, uh, people. We hear from our, our um, 
stakeholders all the time about the concerns with stigma. So obviously some people feel that they will be stigmatized and we know from past experience that can happen. So I think that we need some attention to that milieu we're introducing um, in, in, um, in our settings, in our implementing settings and um, how we're attending to potential negative consequences of things of that nature as well. And I see, Amy, that Katie has responded to your question about negative consequences they've looked at. Katie, do you want to say a little bit more about that and how maybe you guys are trying to protect against it? Sure. Well, there's a whole field. I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily the one um, on the mission to prevent that. But um, so serving in a clinical informatics role, I, I think that we're very mindful of different predictive uh, analytic type tools that we implement making sure that they are evaluated to make sure that they, one, include social determinants of health um, because they are important to include, but also being mindful of whether these predictive analytics, such as machine learning algorithms, have um, are learning from our behaviors that have inherent biases in them. So both pro and con um, of the data that's included or not included. That's great, and I see that we have highlight here as well. So maybe you want to jump in and talk a little bit about the AI for social good and how you guys are thinking about this? Uh, sure. Um, so I would say that we, in, in our current group of postdoctoral fellows, are sort of split between trying to um, implement uh, AI for social impact and um, really thinking about the way that underserved, you, people who have not typically been and historically been served by AI um, can potentially benefit from, from some developments. But I think that there are also folks who are thinking about fairness, which I've been asking, is fairness equity or is fairness, are, are these different things? And I get a different answer from different, different people when I, um, when I talk about this, but um, they're really, is it is basically no it, it's never too early to start thinking and asking these questions about equity um i don't have good examples um of times that this has worked but i one of the things that i do is really sort of push and challenge the folks i work with to think about who who is this for who is going to be missed who's in our population right in the data that we work with Great, thank you. Um, and I know that that Amy had, had posed the question to folks of sharing examples where they're connecting IS frameworks and equity. So given that I know she's pinged a few people to think about, I just want to open up the floor if anyone wants to share their examples or raise issues with this larger group. I know Russ said he had one he was going to share if the people are quiet. So... I think Becca was about to jump in. So Becca, why don't we hear from you and then we can hear from us too. Sure, sure. So um, I, I liked seeing uh, your combining slides earlier because we tried to do something very similar here with our Implementation Science Center, uh, kind of combining the CIFR framework contextually with the Proctor model outcomes. So kind of a similar way uh, that you combined yours. Um, in a very unwieldy figure that I won't share, but I think the thing that um, that was a helpful exercise as we were really thinking early on in our project was, you know, what are those gaps, particularly in the in the contextual side of things that like the CIFR was really not designed to be about equity originally, and I, I hear rumblings that maybe there's a, a new one coming out, and there will they'll be thinking about it a little bit more, but but things like. Um, this is a, a key thing that comes out in a lot of our work, turnover, when it, you're thinking about individual characteristics of, of the people providing the interventions. Like that's so key and kind of completely missing. Um, other things uh, like the outer context is really kind of um, underdeveloped. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about what's the outer context here with our projects that are involved with community health centers in different communities across our state, and how can we build that out uh, systematically. So we tried to develop kind of this, um, this big 
skewed framework that we wouldn't ever apply to like each individual pilot, but each pilot could plug into to kind of dock uh, their work moving forward. So it, it's been kind of an iterative process, um, but I think um, we really took uh, the um, the thoughts of all the members of the investigator team early on of like where the gaps were to to really explicitly say this is how we're going to be thinking about equity in these different parts of CFER and the Proctor model. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as an example and and wondered what kind of um, I don't know struggles or strengths you had when you were trying to combine yours together. Um, and I don't know, throw that out to you. Thanks, Becca. I'd love to see what you guys did there um, with, you know, intertwining CIFR and the equity um, domains. I think that it just felt like a mind bending exercise. I don't know if you felt the same way. And um, absolutely. But, but we, you know, we felt like we bent our minds a bit. And, and it was kind of nice to just have a small group of a few of us. It was three of us, you know, kind of talking through this and looking into the literature deeply, looking at interview guides around PRISM and interview guides and uh, domains around EPIS and the different aspects. And then it just sort of coalesced and we were able to to sort of see some alignment. Um, so that's what I have to say about it. It was a struggle. And I, your point too about it felt unwieldy at times and like something you wouldn't want to share, but it was sort of doing your due diligence to try to, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's and see how things related. I think that's what we're being pushed to do is look at what equity frameworks have and what, you know, what's already been there. How does the, this align with things we, how we call words and, you know, what our jargon is and what our dimensions are in implementation science frameworks and then look for the synergies. I really like Eva Woodward's um, efforts to get us to think of at least a few concrete things as well. It's nice when you, you get it down to a manageable list. To me, I just to add this ahead. idea. No, please sorry, go ahead. Of, of making it concrete. Cause I was thinking as, as Becca said, the, the figure was unwieldy. But at the same time, it provided a roadmap. So I think so much of us, so many of us, you know, when we're planning implementation activities or thinking about how we're going to evaluate, having that roadmap as unwieldy as it may be, still kind of keeps us honest in the sense of are we measuring all the things that we intended to measure, um, and then it gives us a little bit of opportunity across projects and things to have that commonality. So I think, um, you know, it's especially if folks are newer to this idea of how do I integrate equity into my implementation activities. It feels like a really important guide to offer people. Sorry, Russ, what were you going to say? No, uh, really good point. Yours was far more uh, adroit and astute than mine was going to be. Uh, I, I agree with that. And I think there, for me, the issue, a lot of it is how do we turn you know, really broad framework, CIFR or maybe CIFR 2.0, you know, into something that's pragmatically useful because there is so much. And again, that's the issue about context, at least from my perspective, regardless of what model you use, context is really everything. You know, some people have defined it even as everything other than the intervention. And there's so many potentially relevant factors. So how do we focus on in your particular application, you know, which ones to do? I, I, I think that's a, a work in uh, progress. We've tried to kind of anchor our in prison to try and fix a, a few things at, at the risk of not being comprehensive uh, on that. But the other thing is I think we have a tremendous amount to learn. We're at the beginning of this and this supplement that I put in there that some of you in the ISC3 uh, know about that's being led by uh, Borsica Rabin and that's a partnership between our group and uh, Wash U. Uh, I think uh, tied in, as, as you know, uh, Shobo and others quite uh, with the equity uh, work group, quite uh, tightly to them. I think that will uh, have us uh, help us make progress and at least show us some of the real challenges and some different ways of trying to, to integrate these as we go forward. Yeah, and I think one thing that maybe we haven't talked about as much as a group yet is um, you know, this idea of context is sort of everything but the EBI. Um, the importance of participatory approaches, right? So that we're not managing this entire unwieldy context ourselves. And the, you know, stakeholder experts are the ones who are, you know, telling us what the priorities are and how to manage it, especially, you know, with that dynamic context that, that Amy highlighted earlier. I think that just sort of reminds us, and I know many of us on this call are, are already in that space, but I think that's something that we can also highlight um, more broadly to the field. Absolutely. 
and, and that's how we've kind of gravitated to uh, in terms of even prioritizing re-aim outcomes, because we know that particularly unfunded projects or working community groups, you can't do everything. So that's been our solution. People often ask me, you know, well, what's the bottom line on re-aim? Which is the most important dimension, you know, or how do you get there? And I'd say, well, work with your stakeholders, you know, your group to kind of define or prioritize those. What are, you know, what's the most important outcome? And I think similarly, context is there too, and uh, particularly looking, I, I think, and others jump in here too, um, historically, you know, what have been the key contextual factors uh, related to both the quote intervention outcome, you know, and also certainly the equity outcome and things there. And again, at kind of all all levels or stages from whether you even get somebody engaged, who reaches, who participates, who drops out, who benefits, who, who sustains. Thank you. I see Shafika, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Great presentation. And I'm going to ask a question that will demonstrate my ignorance about equity frameworks because I've not used them before, but our work it takes place largely in low and middle income countries. And, you know, often we're assessing evidence-based interventions and its implementations as a result of a policy that is specifically designed to target vulnerable segments of the population. But even within that vulnerable segment, it's not a homogenous group of people. So there are inequities in those settings too. So, you know, it, as the next phase of, of where I want to take sort of my understanding of this, um, I, I was just wondering if, if the more experienced folks have advice about how to start grappling with that question, because it, it, I can't imagine right now how I would measure it. And then often there's the pressure of, of having positive outcomes to support the policy in place <laughs> and not highlighting the negative outcomes so you know having you see for and re-aim is sort of the the standard approaches that we've been using but i would love to be able to start grappling with the notion of equity even in vulnerable populations so i just wanted to pose that question that's a fantastic question and i think it had a few different facets to it because it's a complex question. I heard, I'll just say a few facets I heard and then see if anyone feels um, well equipped to answer because I'm not sure I have the best answer for you. But I heard facets of um, this is a policy and it's eligible, if we're thinking of reach, those eligible to be um, addressed by this policy are very segmented, um, have different segments of a population that is part of this vulnerable population. And this policy may do well for some of that segment and poorly for some of that segment. So um, being able to measure, um, this goes back to the two-tailed problem, um, the, the positive effects and negative effects, and if there were any unintended negative consequences for certain aspects of the population, some of those pieces go back to original re-aim on just reporting, you know, um, who was reached, rep, what was the representativeness of those reached with this policy, and then what were the effects um, for different subgroups. But you really get into it when it's the contextual factors that relate to um, why and how, you know, it, it worked well or didn't. So I, I just want to be the the unfortunate have play the unfortunate role of being the timekeeper, which I just want to recognize it's 455 our time. So I think you guys wanted to, to give folks a stretch break in Colorado. Um, so I would love to keep this going for the next three hours, but um, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close. Um, I just want to thank Amy again for a fantastic presentation and uh, the rest of the Colorado group for, for joining us and for the Harvard folks. Um, you know, please join us again. We've got a whole series planned as Karen highlighted. And I think this is just the beginning of our equity focused conversations. And of course we're on Zoom. So all of you in Colorado are welcome to join for that as well. Um, Karen, did you have any wrap up as we, as we finish here? Thank you Shoba for a uh, fantastic moderation and uh, to Amy for a great talk. And it was so great to see your Colorado friends. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks Thank everyone. everyone. Bye. Thank you, bye.